let's talk a little bit about discounted cash flow. That's the uh, kind of risk that we're more familiar with. The other, these are my worry beats. <coughs> Somebody brought them back for me for, on a trip to Greece. Uh, apparently the old men in Greece sit around on the park benches, look overlooking the uh, sea on the Greek islands and move the worry beads around like this as they try not to worry, I guess, about things they have no control over. In a sense, in the last uh, session, we talked about a risk that you have very little control over. You may try and play the market forces somewhat, but really what we're doing when we're calculating the probabilities that it, something will happen or not that's part of our calculation of a payoff, we're saying, can we recognize a pattern? If we can recognize a pattern, is there some reason to believe that that pattern will continue or not? If there is a reason to believe it will continue, we'll use the pattern we see, and if not, we'll try and figure out which direction it's going to go and what kind of uh, discontinuities or forces are going to cause it to change. The rule of thumb, I should have said, is when you're doing forecasting and looking at whether things will continue or not, is you can forecast as many periods forward as you have data going back. Now, discounted cash flow is a different kind of risk when we're looking at discounted cash flow. Although, to some extent, the kind of market probability is closer to the occurrences that we were talking about before. But really what we're talking about in discounted cash flow is what it costs to get the capital, what's the best alternative use of the capital, uh, which will affect what you have to pay for it. So how do you figure out what the capital cost that you're trying to get? This is called the weighted average cost of capital. And what you basically do is you look at market rates for similar types of capital. Let's take an example. Suppose I want to buy some equipment. Well, I know how to figure out what the cost of capital is for equipment. I go down to the bank or I call up my bank and I say, what's the cost for an equipment loan? And they'll tell me and I can figure it out or I can call up various people who finance equipment and figure out what they're charging for loans. Similarly, if I need operating capital, I can go to the bank and ask about that, or I can go to people who specialize in operating capital. Don't want to go to the kind of guys who break your arm for the capital, but uh, we're talking about legitimate business here. And if I'm looking for equity, well, it depends on what, how I want to uh, view the company. If it's an established firm, I may go into the equity markets. That's the stock market. It's pretty easy to figure out the cost of capital there. You figure out what the uh, average price people are paying for similar kinds of stock. That's a function of the risk of that stock, either in terms of the industry it's in, or the type of firms it is, or the kinds of technologies they work. And if you can create a pool, you can look at the relationship between the risk in that pool and the risk for all stocks across the rest of the market. That's called a beta. And we can calculate the beta for an industry or a kind of uh, company the kind of uh, technology sector, so on and so forth. On the other hand, if we want to know about the cost of equity, we can look at what venture capitalists will pay or rather charge us to get equity for our company. And in Commercialization 101, you'll see a table that is typical discount rates for, uh, or estimated discount rates for uh, various kinds of ventures. And what you'll see when you look at that table, or and we can just discuss it here without going into detail, is basically there's a set of factors that will influence it. The first factor that will influence it is what kind of technology is it? Is this a incremental technology going into a, which means it's just a sort of improvement on what's already being done, using the same kind of technology base. You're just enhancing the features a teeny bit, on the same metrics that everybody's using normally. Is it a adaptive technology, which means I'm using the same kind of technology base, I'm just extending to a new set of features instead of uh, toothpaste, it's toothpaste with fluoride, toothpaste with fluoride and whiteners, toothpaste with fluoride, whiteners, and uh, something else, uh, mouthwash in it. So those are adaptive. A hybrid engine is different. It is a radical technology, it's a different way of accomplishing the same thing only using, the metrics are the same, the, that you're measuring how good it is. It's, 
its features uh, metrics are the same, but the technology that underlies it is different. In the case of a hybrid, you have a combined gas engine uh, with a uh, electric engine. If we were just improving a gas engine, making it run more efficiently, that would be an adaptive technology. If we're switching altogether to a different type of uh, structure for the gas engine, uh, like a Stirling engine, that may be a uh, uh, radical technology. The most risky, th those are more risky than adaptive, obviously, and the most risky are disruptive technologies where we're changing not only the metrics that you would measure it on, but also the way that the technology works, the technology base. So everything's up for grabs. Now, if the type of technology is one factor that influences the riskiness in a venture investment, another kind of factor is how mature the, the uh, technology is. A third factor is, is the market a known market that you're in already, or are you trying to enter a new market? And the final factor is how new is the company and the management of that company? Are they experienced or not? So those are the kinds of things that would affect discount rates, and the discount rates can be everything from very low, uh, the same rate as a treasury bill, bill if it's literally risk-free, up to 50 to 70 percent, uh, depending upon the risk levels. <laughs> now, we said before, and I've been uh, playing with these worry beats, that uh, where you're looking at different pathways of occurrences that are outside your control, all you can do is basically calculate the probabilities, but you don't really have much control over it, unless it's a node where you're making a decision, in which case you do have some control. In discounted cash flow kinds of risks, you always do have an option for some control. Uh, you'll see a flip come up on the screen. This is a flip that simply says, here's the risk, here's how important it is, here's how likely it is to happen. And if we add a column, we can say, here's how I'm going to address it. And so you can begin to think about the risks that go into affecting the discount rate, and you can try and mitigate those risks. The more you can mitigate the risk, the more you can drive down the discount rate. Okay, so that's our quick overview of risk. Now we're going to pull it all together in the next session. Thanks. Well, dinner's over. Still got dishes to do, so let's finish up our discussion of payoffs. Want to start this way.